I think I'm recording now. I did not oh. do that. Go Tess. <laughs> <laughs> Moving up in the world. <laughs> Powers. You got to you have to set your uh your icon to a superhero character now. Okay, I'll I'll pick one and and uh be sure to do that for next time. Cool, thank Action you. item. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So today is a dev session with uh, Zaki, Tony um, from Inclusion and B Harvest on validator key rotation. Uh, if you guys, either of you guys can either share your screen or um, provide something to look at while we're talking. Yeah, I, I just, I opened up a, a Google Doc where I thought we could sort of write things out and keep notes. Um, that's what we can look at. Just, uh, I'll share this. Why is this being weird? Not like. Wow. Oh, okay. I have to. Your Mac OS Catalina changes that you have to do in order to enable screen sharing. So just give me a second. Okay. Do. It's almost as any as many problems as running uh, Zoom on on a Linux machine. Yeah, I'm going to need to leave the meeting and come back to share my screen. So I'm just going to do that. Okay. Um, uh, B Harvest or uh, Tony, do you guys want to start? Either way, I'm just waking up here. So Uh, one thing I can drop in the chat, I guess, um, said uh, I read some of the proposal, and there's one thing I think uh, might be problematic. Um, let's see. Okay, let's, let's, let me also open up the ADR. Okay, can you see my Google Doc? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And let me also open up the ADR. Cool. All right. I think this is a good place to start. Um, okay. Um, maybe I could just like, Tony, you were saying something? Uh, I just shared a link, but it's more of a detail. So if you want to get started at the higher level, that'd probably be good. Okay. Um, let's sort of define what the problem is. Okay. So the problem is, is we have a consensus system with a PKI in it. Um, and that PKI is basically, we have um, some public key, the public, uh, the public key is, the, is the, the public keys for all the consensus members. It's the only way we identify, uh, which is the only way we identify, which is how we identify uh, votes in the consensus um, securely. Um, and, um, uh, so what happens is that right now, um, because we only have this public key, um, and we have users signing their votes, um, with this private key, um, uh, if someone wants to, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, uh, 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 de-operationalize that key um, as part of their routine procedures, um, there is no mechanism to do that. Um, and uh, this might be, this could be bad. Um, let's say uh, 
uh, you're, you have some concerns about the security of that key or um, you don't know whether or not, or you just want to change, for instance, what HSM you're using, um, we don't really have good ways of supporting any of this. Um, and so I, you know, this problem has been uh, in Tendermint for many years um, and uh, we haven't come up with any sort of solution. Um, and uh, B Harvest proposal is perhaps, is like an, a, a proposed solution that doesn't require um, a lot of changes. Uh, and maybe we could ex spend some of this time both exploring what a simple solution to the problem is and what, uh, uh, or, and compare it and contrast it to more complex solutions to the problem. Um, anyone have any comments on the problem that we're solving? I can also share this link to this doc so that more people can. So in summary, it's just like validators want to change their private keys? Uh, they want to change their public and private key pairs in consensus. Yeah. So if you think of a validator, they have two keys. They have right now an operator key and a consensus key. Um, right. And um, um, can, and they currently can't change either. So the consensus key uh, are the signatures that appear in the commit. Is that true? Yes. Okay, thank you. And you can sort of think of the, um, you can sort of think as the relationship between the operator key and the consensus key as like a simple PKI system, where essentially the transaction, like the initial transaction declaring their, um, public key is essentially like a certificate that is presented to the network and being like, this public key is now bound to this operator key. Um, and to simplify what the ADR 16 is proposing, it's basically a new way of certifying a new consensus key uh, with the transaction on chain. Is the operator key present somewhere in the blocks or the headers? Uh, it, is in the, it is in the transaction data and the state um, it is not visible to Tendermint right now. Mm -hmm. is, is, sorry, Sean, do you have more question? No, that's uh, that's good. Is there a reason this can't um, this can't be handled as part of like the uh, edit validator message? I see. Um, I haven't read the ADR, so I don't I don't have too much context, but. Uh, I That's a good point. A new message there. So I also have like a bunch of concerns, but maybe should we should we go through it so so we develop some collective understanding, and then we make sure there's room afterwards for sort of challenges, or what's the best way? Do you think to go through this? Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Um, okay, um, B. Harvest, do you want to go through it? Um, um, okay, so um, I want to uh, share you guys. Uh, big picture of this because uh, this uh, idea is not our um, uh, ultimate idea of uh, consensus key, but uh, we uh, ultimately want to make it uh, uh, one validator can use uh, multiple consensus key is our uh, ultimate goal. So that's uh, actually another uh, issue we raised on Tendermint. But uh, this one is a, a short-term goal, not to change any code base on Tendermint, but only on the SDK side a little bit so that we can uh, enjoy the uh, consensus key rotation. So that's our big picture. So uh, if we want to make uh, consensus key uh, rotated, then we generally have uh, uh, two ways to do it. One way is what we suggested. Another way is to change the code base on Tendermint. So uh, on Tendermint, you can have one key for uh, ide identifying validator and one, another one to use uh, to vote on consensus. But that's uh, quite a big change on Tendermint because uh, now you don't have uh, anything like that in, in the Tendermint structure. So what do you, do you think there's a, sorry, sorry, you mind if I ask some questions? 
Sorry? Uh, is there, do you think there's an advantage to pushing that into Tendermint, the, the distinction between the validator identity and their active key? Mm. Or is it just that it, like it would be available to all ABCI applications to utilize that? Mm. Uh, uh, you mean a multiple key? Do you mean multiple keys or uh, uh, just key rotation? Um, I actually wanted to clarify what you meant by multiple key. So maybe we start there. Okay. So uh, oh. mul the multiple key means uh, in Tendermint system, you have uh -huh. a one key to identify the validator. And yeah. then inside that, you can have multiple consensus key. And then uh, you can participate or uh, using uh, any one of the consensus key any listed on the uh -huh. list. Uh, and uh, on the system, the, the fastest one can be chosen. So uh, our, our, our ultimate goal it has an objective to have a validator co-located uh, across the continents using different consensus keys. Yeah. So that for every proposer, if the proposer is located in uh, American uh, continent, then our validator or in the uh, American continent will vote. So I something see. like that. Yeah. And and in this system, uh, only one key can be uh, proposing, but all the keys can participate on voting. Mm -hmm. So that's our design. Right. So you could, I mean, you can also use that, I guess, for uh, high availability, like if or for failover, right? So if one of your validator keys fails, you can start using the other one. Yes, uh, especially without using KMS. Right. We can we can make it uh, collocated, so we can make it block time shorter. So uh, also the validators can run. Uh, in different continents, so liability is better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would be that would be a big change to Tendermint. It would also have impact on uh, the effective size of the validator data structure for like clients. So they would have to download all of those keys so that they know which one to check. Right. I, I uh, think the header will be much big, bigger. Yeah. 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 I also and, okay, so that's, it sounds like that's something to consider that's a little bit further off, but what we're talking about here more so is just still having a single key for a validator, but allowing it to change over time. Yes, uh, that's so right. Key rotation. And yeah. you were talking about this idea of having an identity that is distinct from the key and baking that into Tendermint directly rather than handling it at the application layer. And so I was wondering what, what you think the advantage might be of baking that into Tendermint um, if there's something beyond just, you know, making it available to all ABCI applications or if there, if there's something, yeah, if there's something more fundamental. Mm, so when, if we, uh, make it happen, uh, by, uh, changing Tendermint to have a identity key and voting key, then the whole structure on the Tendermint side, uh, should be changed. So I, think it is a really big change. It, it, yeah. It's almost like a change that we need to make it uh, multi-key, uh, we imagine. Maybe, but, but it's not like similar, but uh, it's qu quite big change. So right. I think it's not a short-term short, short -term, um, job to do, to do it. But if you uh, achieve, we can also achieve this by uh, touching a little bit on the SDK side. So Tendermint, uh, they, they just know, don't know. Uh, Tendermint does not know uh, it is uh, validator is changed or validator's key is changed. Right. Uh, because Tendermint does not have identity. identity uh, but, oh, oh God. So this actually, um, Tendermint would need to know somehow for the sake of evidence collection because uh, mm -hmm. Tendermint needs to be able to know that. Mm -hmm. the, oh, maybe not. Tender. Okay, so 
I have, I have two thoughts on this. Um, and yeah, so Tenderman might need to know they're the same for the sake of evidence, but go ahead. Well, so Tenderman sh should be able to recognize evidence on the old block with the old key. It's yeah. the state machine needs to know that these things are connected in order for slashing to be applied correctly. Yeah. Uh, but the slashing module is on SDK, yeah. not on Tendermint. So yeah. uh, if S SDK knows everything, uh, why Tendermint ha has so, to... Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it's in there yet, but it's been considered that we would be... Um, uh -huh. I don't think it's a big deal, but I think there, there is going to be a bit of logic that basically tracks events per validator in Tendermint, just as like a denial of service so that Tendermint doesn't process events like evidence events for the same validator over and over again but once per key is probably fine for these purposes so it shouldn't it shouldn't be an issue but just so, some, just something to be aware of yeah my main thought process here is the downside of tendermint not knowing the difference between a validator identity change like i.e one validator actually leaving the consensus group and a new validator coming in and a validator key change is that if you could actually make, there are probably optimizations to make it easier for white clients to handle validator key changes that, whereas the costs of uh, a validator identity change are always going to be high on white clients. Mm -hmm. um, so if this is something that we anticipate validators want to do frequently, um, you know, for the sake of the efficiency of light clients and IBC, I think it would be better to have um, Tendermint be aware of this and be able to optimize the light client for this use case. If we think this is a rare event, um, then it's probably worth the simplification of the code um, to have Tendermint not know the difference between these two events. Right. And I think we would expect it would be a rare event, right? Mm. Yes, we expect it to. Yeah. So we, we, we're seeing different things in like the consensus world. Like you have, um, I think both in the ETH 2.0 spec and the Algorand spec, um, consensus keys are fairly short, are like designed to be short lived. Um, so like on the order of like hours um, and then rotated out relatively frequently. Um, you have, on the other hand, you have like what we're doing, you know, um, I think right now Tendermint is probably the most uh, uh, like, this is your validator key for the rest of time of, uh, in its approach, um, in sort of the wider public consent. Why does ETH cycle keys so quickly? Um, it's sort of being, I mean, one advantage of it is it's a defense in depth against, you know, um, you know, they're all using BLS based signatures. All that cryptography is very immature. Right, like, right. There are constant time issues, like all of these things. Like, okay, so like, why not just cycle keys quick, relatively quickly, and it makes it hard for an attacker to actually um, take advantage of this. Like, it's a trade-off with. Um, uh, and then we also have, um, you know, in the in sort of the research realm, we have we these forward secure signature systems um, that like. Um, you know, the, where the key, where a key is actually essentially unable to sign after new messages after some time. I know an example in, in the case of Polkadot where they use it for failover. So for example, if you want to upgrade a node, you're supposed to change the key, assign like another node and upgrade. So even for upgrades, they are using uh, like key rotation. So do we, does anyone else have any thoughts on whether or not this, we should be optimizing for the rare rotation case, i.e. it's, it should be as roughly as probable that someone will rotate their key as someone will, um, a, like a large amount of voting power will move in the network or should we optimize for the case where we're, where rotating keys are very common and it is like more common than that. And we I mean, I think it's middle ground, right? I mean, the likelihood that large validators move in and out is pr probably much lower than the likelihood that a large validator will cycle their key. 
you know, we could probably yeah. anticipate a big validator to do it. I don't know, once a year, a couple times a year, maybe quarterly. I'm pulling numbers out of my butt, but um, just you know, thinking. But it uh, seems like the like the the industry is kind of standardizing on key rotation. Yeah, and there's in, in saying that maybe we trust our encryption now, but maybe we shouldn't. Um, yeah, it seems very conservative, but it kind of makes sense. So as a data point, the web PKI is generally moved from uh, uh, two years to one year to every three months. Yeah. Something like Let's Encrypt. So. And then, Zachy, when you're talking about optimal, you're talking maybe about like what kind of um, expectation do we have on the light cap client keeping track of these changes? Or what, do you, what, what did you mean so, in particular? OK, so you know, I, f from previous light client discussions, we know that like, you, know, you have to send more headers uh, if large amounts of voting power change um, in the skipping light client. Um, in the bisection, yeah. Um, and for the skipping like so um, if we have key rotation, um, if we introduce key rotation um, or when we introduce key rotation, and if Tendermint doesn't know that like this is a key rotation event rather than a large voting mm -hmm. power move, then it's basically like imposes the same costs on the white client mm -hmm. um, to do a key rotation. If we could introduce some sort of notion of some sort of simplified PKI into the, like with some sort of delegation of rights, like there's a delegation of rights from an identity key to, uh, um, to a signing key in the in tendermint, then we would be able to actually probably have enough information in the block header um, for the light client to then say, oh, this is not a, uh, this is not some right. sudden movement of a large amount of voting power. This is just a key, normal key rotation event. And I can just, um, uh, you know, I see a header. This header has a new key in it, but I know that it, uh, I can see that, the de that that key also has like some sort of certificate delegating rights um, from a, a key that it was constant. And then I don't need to uh, actually uh, uh, go get the intermediary validator set change. Header. Right. Uh, just, just out of curiosity, Anton, are you on this call? Are you active? Yes, I am. What is your sense? Not on really. The... <laughs> what... <laughs> what is your What is your sense on the complexity of um, of the implementation to the light client? Um, it will certainly increase. I mean, introducing introducing rotating keys um, yeah we'll need to store like we'll probably we'll, we'll need to store uh, a history up to some point mm -hmm. like a history of keys up to maybe I know like uh, in order, like in order to form an evidence of of uh, of misbehavior, we'll, we'll need to connect like a certain key to a certain validator, and for that, we'll we'll need to store like a, a certain number number of uh, keys or multiple keys. Uh, I mean. It's it's not like so complex, but yeah, we'll need to um, change the line client for sure. But mm -hmm. um, my, I mean, my feeling on the key rotation thing is, I mean, the industry seems to converging, seems to converge on the key rotation. Um, I think I've read, I've read the article um, by, by near protocol, oh, uh, which was published on nearprotocol.com uh, about lo long range attacks and, uh, 
and uh, there and there like uh, the the rotation of the keys was one of the solutions to long range attacks yeah so yeah i'm not, i'm not sure like like if if any, uh, if all of you understand what I'm talking about, but like, um, is it related to the weak subject? Like if you, if you, if you, if you like, uh, so long range attack, if you, so if you rotate the keys and you throw away an old keys, it will be impossible to adversary to obtain this old keys and perform a long range attack. Of course, like some validators can can choose like to change the code to actually store the old keys and probably like sell sell them to adversary. Yeah. But like if you're if you're if you make an assumption that the majority of the of the validators follow the protocol and like destroy the old keys and uh, generating them like every block then and then it, it it's like improves the security uh against the uh, long range attacks so in a proof of stake system it, and so what do you think uh to anton and to everyone else about like what if key rotation were limited to uh every i don't know two hours or whatever some fixed amount which would essentially cap the inefficiency of the light client bisection what do we that would be a that? like every two hours would be in my mind a lot of nice. yeah i mean my, my expectation is that the the key i mean key rotation i mean it's a it's a serious event for an operator to rotate their key right they have to there's, a, there's like real world overhead to doing that and so i would expect already that the frequency at which they do it is uh longer than the or you know lower than the the light client unbonding period right so that if you're you right. might do it in a few months or something and if they're all uncorrelated you know presumably the validators will rotate their keys in an uncorrelated way with each other um and if they're doing it on a you know with on an order of months and unbonding periods in order of weeks then i would i would anticipate it wouldn't have a very significant impact on light clients who have to sync you know on a weekly time scale anyway um right. So having a few other intermediate headers probably wouldn't be wouldn't be that big a deal. And if they're uncorrelated, if the rotations are uncorrelated, it's not going to cause large changes to the validator set um, all at once. Right. I guess so, my, my question is more related to finding. So if it is a trade off, before we introduce this change, which would, would you know be a protocol change, should we think about what the sweet spot is for the light client, even though you know it's, it's still in development, or or not? Maybe we shouldn't. Is now the time, or do we punt on it? Yeah, I mean, we could we could restrict we could restrict it for validators to be like uh, so that you know they can only change once every three months or six months or something. But so a multiple of the unbonding period. Some multiple of the unbonding period, but then it seems a little silly because the whole point is to like, you know, give them the ability to change when they need to, which could by fluke happen multiple times within a few months, but the expectation would be that would be uncorrelated, sufficiently uncorrelated across the validators and of sufficiently high overhead that they're not going to do it very frequently. So I would, you know, I would err on the side of um, like minimizing the restraint and, you know, hmm. uh, given the expectations that we already have expectations that it will be, you know, happen much less often than an unbonding period. Um, you know, we can reevaluate down the road if the data suggests otherwise, and we find validators are rotating keys every week. But if they're rotating keys every week; they probably have have bigger issues afoot, um, or we've like you know completely misunderstood how key management should happen. But actually, maybe uh, this is what I suspect. Um, for some reason, I, I think that there may be a day where people change their keys quite frequently, like an RSA key to a um, you know database room or whatever it is, you know, those little keychains that kind of rotate yeah. all the time. What if it may, is that where this is going or I don't know. I think, I think there are two things that would be good to clarify. I mean, Saki said something super important there 
about delegation and every time we talk about like key rotation it sounds like we're moving from an old key to a new key and you need the previous key to move to a new one and this is more about the, the delegating because you probably want to have some offline key that is like super important and create kind of like temporary keys to sign and probably you want to create those temporary keys in, in events where you actually have some concern so if you limit that to two three or whatever for a time period and it, it's still the same security issue you might need to kind of change the keys when you have some situation probably you don't want them to do that often so assigning some kind of like expense or fee for changing the keys sure so yeah. do it the economic cost makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. one thing that would be nice about the economic cost is we could actually adjust that economic so i've been thinking about this in two ways like one thing is is yes i the economic cost idea also intrigues me um i'm wondering whether or not how well like we can figure out how to price that uh, relative to like how much like client activity actually exists. Um, I, again, I'm thinking mostly on IV, from an IVC point of view. Like, like when I think about like like clients, I mostly think about IVC, not yeah. and like on chain on like all on chain like clients are just like you know many orders of magnitude more expensive than uh, any sort of local like client. Right. Like efficient mobile white clients and stuff like that are great and nice and amazing, but like really what the use case for the white client is, is in my mind, is IBC. Is IBC. Um, and so like in an environment where you don't have any IBC connections, uh, it probably can be nearly free to rotate your key. Um, in, a, in a world in which you have lots of IBC connections, uh, it should be quite expensive to rotate your key or it makes sense to make deeper changes to, to Tendermint and the white client to, to like, have we would eventually need like a, a key rotation friendly variant of tender. So just just as a time check, we got like a little 15 minutes and change yep. uh, left. W which way do we want to take this? Do we want to keep a, like open design discussion or what's best for you, Bee Harvest, as you are our guests? Uh, from the discussion, I think uh, decision is not made yet. We need some more discussion, I think. So uh, I think it's better to discuss more on this issue. And also, if, uh, if we need to, we also can explore other way, uh, which is uh, suggested uh, to change the Tendermint side. So that we can right. com compare the uh, workload or other uh, computational load, so we can see more uh, directly about the uh, comparison. So I think we need more uh, discussion. Do you think it would be valuable to codify some of that discussion in an RFC, sort of outlining some of the issues that came up today during the conversation? and put that in the uh, spec repo. What do you think? We have this ADR here. I don't know how much of, of what we're discussing is, is reflected in there, but. Yeah. Yeah, the ADR is on the Cosmos SDK. Um, I, I think, I, and this is something that is, is, is sort of the open question is like, should we optimize, should we like, the rare key rotation scenario is very, probably easy to build um, like it it's it's easy to build it, it it's low impact and if we attach a potentially a feed to it like a, a like a, a, a sort of a governance determined parameter for how much it costs uh, to rotate your key we could probably have something implemented quite quickly um, huh. and that would actually like give us some key rotation. Um, so what are, you, what are you recommending, Zaki, that we kind of move forward with implementation or? Well, well, what I'm, what I'm posing the question is, is I, I see really two paths here. One path is we could actually probably converge on an implementation and a design for, a, for infrequent on the order of like once a month or less uh, or longer key rotations uh, very quickly. 
um, and get, probably get something implemented and potentially deployed uh, fast. Um, and it would, it would work with our whole ecosystem. The question is, is, does this solve the problem? Or is the problem we want to solve a fast key rotation thing, which requires considerably more design work? Um, and what that was what do you think is the best medium to answer that question, though? If huh? we can't do it in 10 minutes, uh, where do you think we should do it? Should we schedule another call or? Um, I think we could potentially, I think we should, we could potentially make a decision in the ADR itself. Um, okay. cool. we, could, we could, I would love to get sort of more opinions from the validator set and really pose the question in terms of, is this, is what we want uh, infrequent key rotation solution? In which case we should proceed forward and we can refine that ADR to the point where we can, where we can actually solve that, where we can concretely solve this problem. Or is what we want fast key rotation inside of Tender Mint, which would act, which will have pervasive changes, which will impact like clients, header structure, like all of those things are going to be, and like yeah. quite a bit of design work has to be. Nice. Does that, that seem like a coherent way of posing the problem? And perhaps we could, you know, we'll solicit more input from the, you know, the validator group and, you know, other, other, other teams and make sure that this is what people want. So is that I think the biggest point? problem for me has always been, I haven't been sure what people want. Hmm. Uh, ahead, I, I've always been really skeptical of the key deletion solution to the long range attack problem. Me too. For the record. Yeah. Jericho. I'm just wondering, like, uh, uh, when we talk about this uh, lowering the rate uh, of key rotation, what is the, the cost which is being increased by doing this? So just to, to get a, a feeling of uh, why, essentially, we're talking about two, two separate problems. Um, the cost, if you do fast key rotation without... Um, uh, uh, without doing tenders to the like more pervasive tendermint design changes to enable this is that white client essentially the best white client becomes the linear like the only white client becomes the linear white client skipping white clients become impossible. Basically, it'll cause the validator set chain to change frequently or to appear like it's changing very frequently from a light client perspective. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, Jerko. This is exactly what I'm asking, but I'm wondering, uh, because I was assuming that in this case, we have this identity key. So like why validator set is changing if I'm just because changing. Tendermint, Tendermint's not aware of the identity as distinct from the, from the consensus. Ah, so we assume that, that uh, okay, I see now. So if we don't make any significant, if we don't make any changes to Tendermint and we allow validators at the application level to rotate their key and they do that frequently, then it's, you know, it's gonna cause a lot of turnover in the validator set from a tendermint like client perspective. But we could make large changes to tendermint so that it becomes aware of the identity so that it can actually know the consensus key changed but the identity of the validator is the same. Um, and then you know, the like client can treat it as the same entity. Okay. And so the minimal change to tendermint to enable this would be just to separate identity key from signing key. Yeah, but I'm not sure that it's a minimal yeah, yeah. I, I imagine it's not a minimal thing. Yeah. yeah, minimal in a sense like that that we cannot do we cannot do less than that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, the minute you start touching the tendermint header structure, like at least in my mind right now, I see lots of, of complicated design implications to that. Agree. Yeah. And like eventually, you know, if you work through all of that stuff, you may at the other end of it come to something like B Harvest described at the beginning, which is like actually like, you know, multiple points of presence for a single validator, very fast block times while having a global validator set, like all of that stuff is potentially something that could be enabled um, uh, using these techniques, but. Um, yeah, so for our, yeah, our uh, initial um, approach was to uh, implement this as soon as possible and then we enjoy this for a year. Uh, during this one year, we can research on a multiple key consensus key uh, system, uh, testing a lot of things, and we, we can minimize the risk uh, to adapt that on Tendermint. So that, I think that was the optimal approach.
Yeah. Sounds right. So we are we are happy to uh, continue with this uh, uh, strategy. Cool. So I don't know. My feeling based on this call is that people think is that there's demand for or interest in and curiosity about an infrequent change system. And we could probably, and like we should potentially just do that because it is simple and somewhat low risk. Um, and uh, it might, and then see if how people use that in the wild uh, and then potentially come back to the question of, of, of fast rotation. Exactly. I mean, it seems like very, very straightforward implementation trajectory too, especially if we can reuse like the edit validator message that already exists. We agree. Yeah, I think we can we can do it on the edit validator. Okay. That might that, that that also opens the opportunity to start experimenting with other key types. Like it might you know people might then be able to use that not just to rotate their key but also to change the the key type so if someone wants to move to using like a multi-sig uh or or like an aggregated sig for themselves or whatever um it would open the door to that hmm. i do think that is a potentially very exciting thing um uh i don't it is probably completely infeasible to take a key that was um generated as a, uh, originally as like a single key and then split it up into like a threshold signature. But um, if we had this, it would actually allow, for instance, adopting uh, a threshold ECD, like EDDSA or threshold ECDSA or threshold SNOR behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, one quick question. In the case of using edit validator, does it mean that the identity will remain the same but the signing key will change or the identity will change to the identity would stay the same. Okay. The identity key would stay the same. I've also been a believer in the ability to change that key. Um, the opera, like a message that changes the operator key. Um, yeah. but that's like a separate discussion and that mostly just affects the state machine. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, that, that's actually an important discussion to have as well. Maybe now is not the time for it, but. It's not a tenderman issue either. It's not a tenderman know. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's mostly a, a Cosmos SDK consent uh, issue. Yeah. Cool. So uh, this is the only topic for today, or uh, do you want to uh, discuss other issues uh, from us? So this is the only issue for today's call, as today's call is only an hour. Okay. Um, but we can expand on it. And I know you have other issues on the uh, specific to the P2P layer. Yeah, and um, also double signing protection. That, that one would be the validator key rotation, um, but on the tenderman side. So do you want to, do you want to should we schedule another, another discussion for that? Like this Thursday, or I thought Marco, you said there's nothing scheduled for Thursday, right? Yeah. As of, as of right now, there's nothing scheduled for Thursday. So we can definitely continue this conversation into Thursday. Uh, this, this Thursday? Yes. Okay. This uh, Thursday. Uh, uh, I'm okay with that. Yeah. It would be one, it would start one hour earlier and we would have two hours so we could cover a lot more ground if you like. I know you have, you have a couple, you have a couple um, changes to, tenor, to, the, to the P2P and then also, yeah, the double signing stuff. So we could probably cover a lot of that. Mm, yeah. Yes. I'm gonna stop the recording now, by the way. Thanks, Tess. Oh, okay. <laughs>